Hey everyone, and welcome back. Surprisingly, we've managed to make it through four weeks of this series so far, which is pretty impressive because after I finish, I am looking forward to getting started on my next series, Lifting and Lead Code, where I max out on bench and then proceed to superset that with a lead code problem. So uh, yeah, we'll see if we ever get to that one. Uh, but anyways, today we'll be talking about Facebook Messenger, so let's go ahead and get into it. Alrighty, so as we mentioned, today we are going to be building both Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp, which are effectively the same thing. I think the one difference being that Facebook Messenger actually stores your messages uh, internally and some database, whereas WhatsApp caches everything locally on a device. Don't quote me on that, I'm American, so I don't really use WhatsApp very much, but uh, as far as I understand it, that's the main difference. I'm gonna treat them like they're the same thing. But anyways, here's what an app like that might look like. As you can see on the left side of the screen, we've got a bunch of different chats. For example, the ladies, Donald Trump, Elon Musk, tech lead. I can select one of them and I can show it off. So this would be the chat with the ladies over here. As you can see, we've got Kate Upton inviting me over. We've got Ana de Armas letting me know that she loves Fang engineers. And then of course myself, who is too busy to come over because I'm making systems design videos on my YouTube channel. By the way, this is a very accurate representation of how my interactions with women go in real life. So. Uh, just wanted to put that out there. So let's go through some formal problem requirements so we can actually move into the design in a little bit. So for one, the one thing that we definitely need to be able to do is support chats. So in particular, let's imagine that we can support group chats with up to 10 users. I don't think that's too infeasible of a requirement. You know, you could say 100 users. I think in reality, iMessage supports up to like 32. So I feel like 10 is the same order of magnitude and that should be reasonable enough. We need to be able to send messages as a user. We need to be able to receive them on our client devices in real time on every single open client device. And then we also should be able to persist these messages in some sort of database table so that if I were to log in on a new device, I can go ahead and access those historical messages. And of course, load older conversations. So let us get into some capacity estimates so that we can get a sense of how much scale we're going to need to build for. Let's imagine that we've got around a billion total users. That's not actually that unreasonable considering that's about an eighth of the globe and that's about probably how many users Facebook has. If each user sends around 100 messages a day, which I also think is pretty reasonable, if each message is around 100 bytes, including the metadata, which again, if a message is, you know, let's say like 20 characters on average or maybe 50 characters on average, when we include the metadata, that probably puts us around 100 bytes. So multiplying those three numbers together, we can see that we'll store around 10 terabytes of data per day and multiplying that by around 365, or let's round it to 400, that's about four petabytes per year. So a lot of data, but at the same time, if you're a massive company that makes a lot of money like Facebook, you can go ahead and afford storing that much. You're just gonna have to do some partitioning. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do in order to kind of introduce the data models that we're using is touch upon a couple of key data structures or database schemas that we're going to need. And then from there, we can actually talk about the sending and receiving of messages within a group chat. So the first data table that I'm going to talk about or database that I'm gonna talk about is the chat members table. So basically, the idea here is that when we have a chat, we need to be able to know, and especially for a given user, what chats that user is in. That's very important for that kind of left part of this view over here. I need to be able to query and figure out what chats I'm actually in so I can build this section. So an easy way to make sure that we can do that and do it quickly such that the query returns fast is by making a data table that looks something like this. We've got our user ID on the left, our chat ID on the right, and as long as we index and partition by that user ID, we can ensure that not only are our results sorted in the order that we want, but also that basically we can ensure that all of our queries to find all of my chats, for example, would be on a single database partition. That is going to be very nice. Now you may think to yourself, well, what if we want to increase the right throughput for a table like this? What if I'm constantly joining new group chats? I mean, for starters, I don't really think that would happen that often, and that's why I ultimately assume the database is not going to be a performance bottleneck. But let's imagine, as just a thought experiment, that we really did need some great performance on this one. Well, what we could do is employ something like a leaderless replication schema for our database. The issue with that is that what if on one node, right? I basically say join group chat. And then on this guy over here, which has yet to synchronize with the first leader, I go ahead and say leave group chat. And then these guys eventually sync together somehow, 
and then it's kind of arbitrary which message is actually going to win. So I may end up either being in that group chat or not being in that group chat. And that could be bad, for example. You know, if it's not me writing join group chat or leave group chat and it's someone else doing it on my behalf, maybe they wanted to kick me out of the group chat and now all of a sudden I'm still in there and they can see me talking shit about them. So at the end of the day, uh, probably is important to have a single leader if we want to maintain causal dependencies. That being said, the one possible solution we could use for a leaderless database schema would be something like a set CRDT, where if a join group and a leave group is in that set, when we aggregate those messages together, then we could say that, oh, you know, effectively, if there's a leave, that must have meant that there was a join at some point, and as a result, we must know that uh, the join is invalid. You could also use version vectors for the same point. Uh, I'm not going too in depth on this one because frankly I think it's a bit of a tangent and I go into it a little bit more in the last video anyways. So let's move on from that. The point is ultimately single leader replication is going to ensure that our causal dependencies are consistent and additionally it's probably not a performance bottleneck for this table in particular. Let's just use MySQL. That is basically going to be the same premise for the next table that I'm going to talk about, which is the users database. Obviously, we're going to need a users database. We have users, and the fields that we're basically going to need are a user ID, an email, a password hash, something like that. And of course, because there are a billion users, this is going to be a massive table. We are going to probably have to partition it. Let's do so on the user ID. This just makes it easy, assuming that we partition and index on the user ID, to find the data for a given user. We can just do something like the hash range and assuming that we have some sort of consistent hashing schema that we're following, we can use a load balancer to really quickly go to the right partition for a given user and fetch the data as we need it. So again, even though this table will have a lot of rows, it's not going to have that many reads to it and it's not going to have that many writes to it, all things considered, especially when compared to our eventual chats table or messages table. And as a result of that, again, let's stick to MySQL. You might be seeing a pattern here. But the thing that's going to break the pattern eventually is going to be our messages table. So what's the one requirement that I mentioned so far about our messages table? Well, it's that we do want to eventually be able to load historic messages because let's say I was signed in on one device and then I open up a second device and I wanna see all of my messages that I've sent in the past on there and have been sent to me, I need to be able to query this database. So this should ideally be fast. So imagine that we use the following schema. We could have some sort of chat ID and we can partition by this so that all of the messages for a given chat are on the same partition. We can order by a timestamp per message so that our messages are pre-sorted in the order that we want to be viewing them in. We can have the message content and perhaps some amount of metadata such as the sender. So keep in mind that because our messages are pre-sorted, because the messages are already on the same partition, ideally the query to fetch historical messages for a chat within a given time range should be relatively fast. Now, in particular, I like to compare my solutions to the Grokking the Systems Assigned solutions. And one thing that they make a whole big deal of is ensuring that all the devices either see the same ordering or that all the devices for a given user see the same ordering, but not necessarily across all users in the group chat. Personally, I think you should just use this timestamp field to maintain ordering. That's something that you can do on the front end where you basically, you know, if we were using React, we would use a map function to basically order by this timestamp field. The question is, what timestamp do we use? Do we use client-side timestamp? Do we use server-side timestamp? I imagine that the server-side timestamp would probably be a bit more consistent, whereas a client-side one, you know, could potentially be fudged. Uh, but either way, you know, let's just go ahead and get a timestamp in there. Even though distributed timestamps are not technically reliable, at the end of the day, this is a messaging app. It doesn't really matter if I send a message a millisecond after you and it looks like it came in first. It doesn't really kill anyone, and so I think it would be just fine to use a timestamp. Let's be pragmatic. That's the point of being an engineer. So the question now is, we have our messages data format but what is the actual database that we'd like to use? Well, this of course is going to determine, uh, or rather be determined, based on what we want to optimize for. So for our table, do we care more about reads or do we care about writes? Well, I think it would be fair to say that we would care about writes a little bit more if all of our messages were first being sent to a database, and then after we sent them to a, a database, we would do some additional processing to them uh, to make sure that they got delivered to every user's device. At the same time, if this wasn't the case, then perhaps we could just fully optimize for reads. So what would we do if we wanted to optimize for reads? Well, our options could be something like a B-tree index, 
The reason that this is good is because, you know, as opposed to reading from multiple different SS tables, we basically just read from one place in the sense that, you know, we traverse a tree. And of course, another thing that we could potentially do is employ column-oriented storage. So the question is, how would column-oriented storage actually help us here? Well, it would be very useful depending on the, the size or the amount of metadata submitted with every single message. So imagine that, you know, the amount of the chat message that we actually care about reading is say like 30% of the message and then 70% of the bytes were metadata. Well, then it would actually be very useful to us to just ditch that metadata, only read the, uh, the part that we actually care about and then go ahead and show that on our client devices. On the other hand, you know, if metadata was 10%, column oriented storage probably wouldn't really help us that much. But I think that it could actually help us overall because at the end of the day, most of these big you know, social media sites are probably including as much metadata as possible with every single message. They're doing a lot of post-processing on this type of data for data analytics. And at the end of the day, I could see it being useful. So for that reason, I'm actually going to deviate from my original messenger design where I recommended Cassandra, and I'm going to agree with Grokking the Systems Design interview that we can probably get away with using HBase. Keep in mind though that HBase is not the fastest solution for writes. Even though it does use an LSM tree based architecture, which is nice in terms of actually getting away with writing to memory first before that write gets flushed out to disk, the big downside of it is that it uses single leader replication. And so while it's true that we can probably go ahead and partition our table a lot and achieve better write throughput as a result of that, it is possible that maybe that still wouldn't be good enough. So perhaps what could we do to actually write somewhere when we make an initial message write such that it is still relatively fast in terms of uh, performing that write? Well, perhaps we could actually first buffer every single uh, chat write by putting it in Kafka. So first we would hit some sort of messaging service. We could then throw the message right over here into Kafka, which we can partition on our chat ID. Then, of course, as I love to always do, we can put things into Flink. The reason being that Flink and just using Kafka in general ensures that every message is processed at least once so we can be sure that none of these messages are getting dropped. Uh, this is because Flink will occasionally effectively checkpoint its state over to something like S3, which is really nice. And then from there, in Flink, we can not only go ahead and insert the message into our HBase database, which is again going to be partitioned on chat ID, but we can also then send it to all the other devices which care about it, such as my phone. Now, keep in mind, that uh, the question is, even though Flink is going to make sure to process every message at least once, it could be the case that uh, Flink is going to send that message more than one time to HBase. This can happen because you know Flink can send the message, it can never hear back from HBase because of some sort of network partition, and it can go down in the meantime. So when Flink then comes back up, it might send a duplicate message. So how can we avoid this happening? Well, what we can do is we can assign something like an item potence key to every single message. And we can do that right over here on the server. So we give the message a UUID such that when Flink goes ahead and replays it, we can actually change our data schema a little bit so that instead of just being sorted by both time or, or rather just time in our database, we can sort the message by time and UUID. So now we know that if we see a message for a given chat with the same timestamp and the same UUID, it should get replaced. Should be simple enough, we would use something like an upsert operation, which basically means insert or update if present, and this is going to get the job done for us. We don't really have to worry about write conflicts or anything because HBase is single leader, and we don't really have to worry about our write throughput of HBase as much because at the end of the day, everything is getting buffered by Kafka, so as long as it gets into that log-based message broker originally, we should be good to go. So the question now is when we actually get a message and we get it into our Flink node over here, how can we go ahead and get it over to the client devices? Well, basically, the idea that we're going to try and follow is this. If I'm a phone and I am running the messenger application, ideally I want to maintain as few active connections as possible. The reason being that every single active connection is going to use extra data and it's also going to use extra battery life on my device. So in an ideal world, every single phone that's running the messenger app 
can just maintain a single active connection. And that is the idea that we're going to try and pursue. Every single user is going to maintain a connection with one chat server. And now the idea is that if we have a group chat with just 10 users, then the chats at most have to be sent to just 10 different places. So now imagine the following. If we have our Flink node, and the Flink node, keep in mind from the last slide, is receiving our messages via Kafka right here. What the Flink node can also do is receive change data capture, or CDC, from our actual chat members table, which means that for a given group chat, for example, chat one, it's going to know that user two and user four are a part of chat one. It can cache this locally. The reason that we cache this locally and use change data capture as opposed to pulling from the database every single time is so that we can make fewer network calls over to the database and can just cache the results as we need them. So keep in mind that we now have basically a local cache of every single uh, user within a database, or rather within a group chat. And so once we have this, we can then say for every single user I within the chat, in parallel, we can hit some sort of load balancer, which is then going to send all of these messages to the server, the chat server, that user two and user four are connected to. So now this might seem simple enough. I've kind of abstracted things away a little bit. I think the question, if you're kind of looking at this one, might be, well, how does our load balancer know where everyone is connected to? So that ideally is going to be the next piece of the puzzle. So how does a user get connected to a chat server in the first place? Well, basically, we should probably use some sort of load balancing method, perhaps consistent hashing. So you can see over here, if we have something like a zookeeper, now keep in mind this is a coordination service, it's strongly consistent. The reason it exists is so that we can make sure that we have some sort of consistent hashing ring that every single node in the system agrees upon. What we actually want to do is take a user ID on any single client device and then say, hey, for this user ID, we know some function that says f of user ID equals server ID. So that way, by using this consistent hashing function, we can very quickly figure out which server a user is going to be connected to. And we need to connect to the server for two reasons, both for sending messages to that server and also for receiving messages from that same server. So as long as the load balancer is listening to Zookeeper, sorry about that ambulance, come on guy, get out of here. And we're back. So as long as the load balancer is listening to Zookeeper, which you can do, it's fully a functionality of Zookeeper that you can actively listen to changes on it, the load balancer will know the function, which is the consistent hashing ring, and that way, whenever a user says, hey, I wanna connect somewhere, it's going to point to the load balancer, and the load balancer is going to redirect it to one particular server. So the nice thing about load balancers as well is that you don't just have to have one of them. You can actually scale these out. If you watch my load balancer video, you'll know that you can have these in an active, active configuration, which basically means that not only do we have one load balancer, but we can actually have multiple different load balancers, and they're all going to be listening to Zookeeper. So they'll all know the consistent hashing function. So again, the nice thing about this is that all of those load balancers are going to point every single user to the same exact place. So when a user goes and starts up, it's going to first, reach out to the load balancer. Next, the load balancer is going to point it to a particular server based on the load balancer's uh, function for consistent hashing that it gets from Zookeeper. Number three is that the server is now going to initiate some sort of handshake with the client and four, the client is going to respond and then we're good to go. Actually, we may have to switch the order of three and four, but the gist is the client and server are now connected directly to one another after first going through the load balancer. So the question is, well, what if this guy goes down right here? Well, what we can do is this guy can be sending occasional heartbeats to both the client and to Zookeeper. So when it goes down, we can configure our timeouts such that Zookeeper knows first and updates all of our load balancers. So now the load balancer has the new consistent hashing function. And then eventually, user nine is going to say, wait a second, I haven't received a message in a minute. Hey, load balancer, assign me to someone new. And the load balancer is now going to assign it to something like S3, which is going to, again, establish a handshake with our client device.
And so now we're good to go again. So one important thing to note is that we should make sure that if you know there's user nine and then over here we've got user 10 and user 10 was also connected to S2, maybe this guy, user nine, should time out after something like uh, 60 seconds and user 10 should time out after something like 55 seconds. The reason being that uh, if user 9 and user 10 were to time out at the same exact time, we could potentially cause a thundering herd. You know, if we've got a million different devices all trying to go through the load balancer and they all get mapped to the same different node, then we may bring down that server and that would be very bad. So it's important to have some sort of random jitter there. So the question is, we know now that every single client device is going to have some persistent connection with a chat server so that it can actually receive messages from there. The question is, what actual real-time connection protocol should we be using? Well, let's think about the properties that we actually want within that protocol. For one, we're going to send and receive a lot of messages. And it would be great if we didn't have to constantly reestablish connections all the time, because when we do, it means that every single request has to send a bunch of headers and metadata, and that is going to take up some space and make a request slower. So for that reason, maybe we can rule out long polling. I'm not saying it's infeasible, it would just be a nice optimization to be able to send less data every time we send a message to the chat server and every time we receive a message from the chat server. Additionally, it would be pretty nice if we had some amount of control over when the actual client reconnects to the server. If a connection between a client and server goes down, we don't want it to instantly reconnect because again, we could cause a thundering herd. It would be nice if we can establish some sort of random jitter. So for that reason, perhaps maybe server sent events isn't the best thing for us because it does do this automatically, at least to my knowledge. It's possible that one of you might look at the docs, prove me wrong, and then I look like an idiot. But either way, I think that uh, the biggest argument for my ultimate choice here is going to be WebSockets, and that is going to be that we want bi-directional communication. Not only are we sending messages to a chat server, but we're also receiving them. It would be nice if we could just have one persistent connection. It's going to keep things as fast as possible. And so it seems to me that WebSockets is going to be the technology that we want to go with. So with that all out of the way, hopefully I've covered everything in a decent amount of detail and we can actually get ourselves to the final design. So here on our left, we've got a client. So the client has a couple of things that they can do. For starters, they can always hit the user service and they can always hit the metadata service. And the metadata service and the user service is going to be responsible for both the users table and the chat members table, which I mentioned are both probably not going to be performance bottlenecks. So as long as we keep them as MySQL tables and are just smart about how we're actually partitioning those, whether it's on the user ID for the users table or the chat ID for the chat members table, then we can go ahead and do an easy enough job there. Now actually, funny enough, look who was being an idiot, was that I said that we should partition on chat ID in the chat members table. And if you recall earlier, I mentioned that we should be partitioning on the user ID, which I stand by and uh, I wrote this down incorrectly. So the point is we should index on the user ID for both of those so that we can quickly figure out for a given user what chats they're actually in that is going to be helpful. Then from there, in addition, we need the change data capture from the chat members table, but the main difference that we're gonna be doing is rather than sharding this by user ID, we're actually going to shard by chat ID so that within a Flink node that's going to be responsible for sending messages out, we actually know for a given chat ID what users they have. And that would look something like chat one has user two, user four, user six. So obviously we need to be able to know uh, what users are in which chat as a result. Okay, the next step of this is the actual handshake with the chat service. So a client would start up their device, they would open up the messenger app, and the first thing that would do is hit our load balancers. Now keep in mind that somewhere over here we would have like a zookeeper, which is responsible for that consistent hashing function, but the load balancers in the active active configuration will probably be going ahead and caching that consistent hashing ring, and as a result, they can connect our client with one of the chat servers. Let's say we connect with this front guy right over here. So from that point, the client is going to establish a WebSocket connection with that chat service. So now, if a message were to go from uh, Flink over back through the load balancer and into the chat service, it could then go over to our client, which is going to be very useful for receiving messages. But let's first look at how sending a message might look. 
The client would hit the WebSocket. It would go ahead and send a message to the chat service. The chat service would then publish it over to Kafka down here. The, the messages themselves are all going to be sharded on chat ID so that we can make sure that the Flink node that receives that message knows which users are in the chat. And so then when Flink receives the message for chat one, it's going to say, oh, I see that I have to publish this for user two, user four, and user six. So then in parallel, what it can do is send a request saying, hey, I have to contact user two, user four, and user six all at one time, and that can go through the load balancer. Now keep in mind that the load balancers have the consistent hash function cached locally, and as a result, they can then send that message and route it to whichever one of the chat services they actually need to do. This chat service is going to be horizontally scaled. As you can see over here, I've got like three instances. And let's say we have to send it to every single one of the instance because each one is connected to user two, user four, and user six. And then once that message comes in, the chat service can then look at its local WebSocket connections and say, oh shoot, this is going to one of the users I'm connected to. Let's go ahead and send that back over. Of course, the last kind of piece of the puzzle is actually being able to read historic messages. That is going to also be uh, imported from Flink, such that when Flink receives a message, it's going to reach out to the chats table, which is up here. Now, the one thing to note about the chats table is that I've kept that as an H-based table, the reason being that column-oriented storage is going to allow our data model for chats to get particularly beefy if we want to add a lot of metadata while still keeping reads pretty fast. We can partition by chat ID to ensure that all messages for a given chat can be fetched relatively quickly, and of course, pre-sort by both time and UUID. The time for actually sorting the messages on a client device and the UUID for ensuring item potence when messages are published from Flink. Anyways guys, I hope this design makes a decent amount of sense. This is not too long of a video, which is good, and uh, that means that we didn't have to go too crazy with deep diving. Uh, this is, again, kind of actually a similar design to something like Twitter or to Google Drive even, where we're effectively using change data capture to route things to the proper place. But yeah, hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here. And uh, as always, if you have anything to roast me about in the comments, please do. I'm looking forward to it. Have a great week, guys, and I will see you in the next one.